when you are sitting in the meeting with the engineers designing it, your job is to kind of, hey, remember there's a, there's a pink body inside this thing. From EE Tech Media, this is Moore's Lobby, where engineers gather to talk all about circuits. I'm Dave Finch. Today in the lobby, we get first-hand electrical engineering perspective from a double E NASA astronaut. I personally don't know how we managed to book this person, but I'm joined today by astronaut Matthew Dominic, a highly recognized pilot and astronaut who started his career with a BS in electrical engineering from University of San Diego with minors in math and physics. He holds a master's of science in systems engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School. Um, it remains unclear whether he is also a secret world-renowned jazz pianist, but I wouldn't be surprised if he were. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the lobby. <laughs> so excited to be here. Uh, I, I love this format, and uh, I love being able to geek out with uh, fellow nerds and talk about cool stuff. Me too. And I don't. There, I know there's a lot of engineers in the world. I always feel like there's not enough people to geek out with and just talk about nerdy engineering stuff. So um, I, I, I've been looking forward to this certainly for a couple of weeks. And that, my first question um, is is related to sort of, you know, your transition from test pilot and fighter pilot and into astronaut work. And the question is this, are devilishly handsome good looks a prerequisite for fighter pilots? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I used to get uh, I used to get a lot of trouble uh, in one of my previous squadrons, uh, there was, you know, you're on an aircraft carrier, there's a bunch of squadrons, there's typically four fighter squadrons and a couple of helicopter squadrons and an early warning attack, all these other squadrons. Yeah. And uh, our squadron was labeled the follically challenged squadron. And uh, <laughs> I was always threatened because I was one of the only pilots in the squadron with hair. Uh, so they were going to take my hair in the middle of the night. So no, <laughs> is the answer. They were going to take my hair in the middle of the night. There's our poll quote. I think the rest of the interview is just gravy right now. Well, I mean, at one time it did happen. I mean, you can imagine being on a, a boat uh, <laughs> for a couple months uh, with nowhere to go. And it, you, you're just the same people every day and you're kind of having a good time. And and uh, I had uh, pulled a prank on somebody else, uh, which is one of my favorite activities. And uh, I was uh, kidnapped and uh, drug into a room and they buzzed all my hair off. Uh, to get back at me. And it was, I was laughing the entire time, <laughs> which you know, really just... surprised them. <laughs> well, it, it, that's the camaraderie. That's, uh, that's gotta be so much fun. It's sort of the opposite of that full metal jacket scene where they you know, beat him with soap in the middle of the night. Yeah. That's, that's not healthy. <laughs> not healthy. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've actually, I, I have been looking forward to this, uh, for several weeks now. And, and when the editorial team, by the way, um, at all about circuits mentioned that we'd be, uh, interviewing an astronaut i was like all right cool you know that's I, I love astronauts but um then i started reading your bio and um you know if you're already a, if you're not already aware of how cool you are listen to this so you finished your undergrad in 2005 you get sent to florida for two years for flight training so now you're probably early 20s right 23 24 that sounds right okay um that's when you receive uh you, received designation as a naval aviator for the u.s navy they put you in the fa 18e super hornet which <laughs> it's like the the de facto i mean there's i think we have 600 of these right now um uh in, in the u.s if i'm not mistaken um easily one of the most badass planes uh man has invented and it's been getting these like these overhauls right since the since the 1980s um and uh then you get assigned to something called uh, I don't know what this is. I can imagine what it is. The strike fighter squadron. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny to hear like, like that's just normal words for me, but you know, like, it's, and they're like strike fighter squadron one, four, three. And, uh, and, and then you look at it and you go, what are you talking about? It makes sense. I'm like, so are you guys the group of planes that flies over things? And 
<laughs> yes. Yes. Strike Fighter scored at one four three. It's like uh, you're being interviewed by Patrick Starr from SpongeBob. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so now you're assigned to this uh, Strike Fighter Squadron One Four Three. You're you're flying missions. Who knows where? You're. I mean, you're doing the coolest stuff. You're doing carrier takeoffs and landings. Um, and then, so while you're doing all that, they say, "Hey, this guy's uh, pretty great." So they start grooming you to be a test pilot. Uh, and then while you're learning to be a test pilot, why not? You've got some free time on your hands. You get a master's in systems engineering. <laughs> And then you start getting pulled into projects like, uh, you know, uh, you've had your hand in the X-47B, which is an unmanned um, carrier-based combat plane, I think from Northrop Grumman, um, the V-22 Osprey, a bunch of others, not the least of which being my current favorite fighter of all time, the F-35, um, uh, because I'm a, a double E dork. Um, that is a double E airplane. And so is the Super Hornet. I, you know... The, the fighter pilot world is full of, you know, fighter jocks and uh, I'm a double mm-hmm. E nerd. And I always, <laughs> you know, everybody would say, Hey, we're, we got to go start up the jets. we got to launch. And I would, I would never say start up the jets. I would always say, Hey, we got to go boot up the jets. Nice. And it was just my subtle way of poking. Like, like this is a, this has got four flight control computers. It's got, you know, all of this mission computer hardware. It does this incredible data fusion stuff with all of its sensors. Uh, it does all of these things. Like this is an electronic, uh, so the F, the, the Super Hornet, you know, is a newer airplane. It came out in 1998 and it just keeps getting all these upgrades. And the F-35 is, is a double E machine. Like you have all of the, you know, PhDs and radio frequency doing their black magic over there in RF land. And in the sensor fusion, you've got the optical folks doing optical stuff. And then, you know, just, it's a double E airplane. I mean, a, a, a stealth airplane is is a radio frequency, you know, beast, right? I can't go into all the details. It's classified, but you can go read about how that stuff works, uh, you know, in the unclassified sense. So, yeah, I mean, the world is run by double E's. They just don't know it. Exactly. They're the ones getting their hair shaved off and getting wedgies <laughs> below deck. Whoa, 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 whoa. The first one is true. The second one is made up to <laughs> embellish the story. I'll call you right out there. But no wedgies were given. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> well, I'll get a, a high-ranking government official... Um, asking me to edit my humor (laughs) you know but you're making a really good point um when you start talking about like sensor fusion and all the onboard computing that's happening um i was reading about the cockpit overhaul uh most recently for the super hornet and you went from sort of these tactile like physical legacy controls and the old display all onto what was described as almost like a single piece of glass and a, a touch display so that nothing is they used to have a display that sort of rested between the pilot's legs. So if you were controlling the stick, like your forearm was blocking the view. So they put everything in, in as much of a heads up as they could. But I understand that there's different grades of electronics. There's consumer grade and then there's, you know, military aerospace and they're two completely different ball games. But I'm conducting this interview with notes on an iPad. I'm not even reliably scrolling up and down on a notepad application on an iPad. And I'm just wondering when you're, flying a mission and you've got all this stuff that you're having to pay attention to what is your relationship with something like a touch screen like that to me that blows my mind that that's what's at the heart of the new cockpit oh man you have opened up a giant can of worms sir <laughs> giant can of worms <laughs> we could have a podcast just talking about touch screen versus buttons i can imagine <laughs> i mean i could actually probably talk for an hour about toasters a toaster design um <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. We'll just we'll just tease your listeners about this man. I ran into the favorite toaster of my life a couple of years ago, and I just I just love it. And I actually use it at work as an example of design. But oh, let's let's talk let's talk about touch screens. <laughs> Have you ever used a touch screen device uh, and it you touched it and it you didn't get the response you wanted? Yeah, like one time out of three. Right. Well, that's huge. Uh, I think. Um, some people are like, well, I need the rely, you know, I need it when I touch the, my screen uh, with my finger, right? Especially, you know, it depends on what it is, right? You have capacitive, and then you have uh, what's the kind with wires behind it? Resistive. That bingo. That's why we keep you around. So you have a capacitive <laughs> touch screen, you know, right? and reliability went up, right? Like you remember when we used to have stylus, right? Right. And it re- remember when like uh, Steve Jobs famously just trashed the concept of a stylus. And like those are some famous videos about, and because they were very focused on user 
uh, interface and user design. And when I push something, I need to have a response. So I can't remember, like there's some hip pocket numbers, you know, when I push something, if I don't get a response, you know, four or 5% of the time, that's a huge failure rate for people, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. how many times do you send a command to your phone via touchscreen uh, a day, hundreds, and you know, right. 10 failures a day is going to be obnoxious. The other number that I found was really interesting that professor gave to me was 50 milliseconds, I believe was the number. So if you make an input to a device via a tactile button or a, uh, or a screen, if you don't get a response within 50 milliseconds, it enters the annoying phase. And also you are very highly likely to press it twice Yes, because you didn't get the response. So now let's take this concept and let's move it to tactical airplanes, right? So you set up the stage, you painted the picture. You said, hey, there's 25-year-old Matt. He's in a jet carrying ordnance, right, that's going to blow up, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, I'm now in a position as a 25-year-old flying over a foreign country with friendlies and non-friendlies and having to make life and death decisions, right, by myself. And they're somewhat high stress. I would say they're high stress decision making going on there. Uh, when I push a button, I need to see a response. Mm -hmm. I need to see a response. Uh, so on the older Hornet displays, there was the display in the middle. And there were, I think, 20 buttons around the outside that called mm -hmm. edge keys. And so you would push them and you would get a response every time. And yeah. the response time was nearly instantaneous, right? The debouncing circuitry was spot on uh, in them. Uh, mm -hmm. and there was a, a tactile feedback. Uh, so I could put my finger on the button, but be looking outside that something was going on or looking at another display and push it. And I would get that sensation in my finger that it was pressed, that I made contact. I didn't necessarily have to be looking at it to know that. Um, and, uh, the original Hornet, the one you talked about was built in the eighties, uh, had a, what we call an upfront control in the front middle, right in front of your face where you would dial in numbers. And so, you could select any display, but then you could send numbers to that display from this keypad. And the keypad was right below your heads up display. It was the center of your, you know, where there, but it had like a, you could put your hand on the side of it, your four fingers, imagine, you know, your pinky through index finger on the side. And then mm -hmm. you could use your thumb to push numbers on it. And there was a, there was a mechanical keypad and you yeah. could feel it. Right. Uh, but in the super Hornet, they upgraded to a, I will call it a touch screen. It wasn't actually a touch screen, uh, but it was, it had the feeling of a touch screen and they mm -hmm. solved that problem in an interesting sense. Like, but it was, it was really annoying. It was very hard to get used to for folks because they weren't getting that tactile feedback when they pushed a button, right? That you had to stare at the display. Whereas before I didn't have to look at the display. I could be typing in numbers with one hand, flying with the other, looking outside at what was going on and kind of, but I lost that when I went to touch screen. Cause I'm, I'm thinking of the guy or the woman who's sitting in the plane, like you said, and you're in the mission now. You're the one making the decisions. It's not the coach calling in the plays. To make that right decision, you need access to only the most important information and then the other information when you want it, and you need it right now. And like I, I know it's a false equivalency, but when I'm just sitting down and I want to turn on Netflix and my old infrared remote worked perfectly on an old TV. I changed the channel, I hit the button and it, boom, it changed the channel right away. But now all these like wireless remotes and stuff have, have gotten so quote unquote sophisticated that I push a button, nothing happens. I'm like, wait, did it register that? And I push it again. And now suddenly I'm, I'm watching a Sandra Bullock movie. I had no intention of watching. Oh, that is the worst failure mode. <laughs> the worst failure mode. That would be a great title for a Sandra Bullock movie. <laughs> oh man, I'm in trouble. But like that's that's this this move to RF and you've increased software complexity and and the like mm -hmm. software complexity has gone way up. So your processing time is huge and you've got these latencies and these RF devices, you know, your RF input devices. And latency is incredibly annoying. Like I have a hardwired keyboard for a reason at home, right? I have a it is it's both. Like I've got a beam splitter so that when the keys go down, it breaks a laser beam so I get really fast response. But wow. it's also a mechanical keyboard, so I have that tactile response. Uh, when I push uh, the buttons, I get that the physical feedback. I get the audio feedback because it makes this really incredible noise that uh, that mm -hmm. <laughs> that drives everybody else in the house nuts. <laughs> I mean, it's right here. I just, I mean, doesn't that just sound incredible? I don't know if that's. It sounds through. like you're getting work done. Oh man, I'm just crushing work right now. Uh, <laughs> but everybody else in the house is losing their mind. <laughs> hey, we could do a whole separate ASMR <laughs> podcast just on that sound. <laughs> it's so satisfying. Yeah. That's man's sort of, um, we'll say, interface to 
this really important, you know, sixty-seven, sixty-nine billion dollar machine, whatever it costs. It depends uh, if it has CDs, CD or leather. It depends on which model you have. <laughs> yeah, do, do they put air conditioners in those standard, or do you have to? It is the AC is standard. Uh, it's actually a really big problem if the AC goes out because uh, yeah, you're, you're essentially in a greenhouse and you're above the clouds, so uh, it gets pretty hot pretty quick. <laughs> um, and by the way, one of the one of the greatest things ever is you get the technological sort of uh, power of an F thirty five, and and it's like the least technologically savvy or, or impressive thing. To keep the pilot awake at nine G's or whatever it is, you you literally are just squeezing your leg muscles to keep the blood in your head. Like there's no technology that will just keep the blood in your head. Uh, I mean that's that's the best you got, right? And, and that translates very much to space travel, right? Like I, I oh man, this is this is a whole another can of worms. I'm good at this. I'm going to keep you completely <laughs> off your plan of talking. Uh, <laughs> that's great. But you know, you you everybody thinks about you know the rocket equation or all yeah. of these different things, and they think about all of the big shiny objects that you have to design the automation, the thrusters, and the pieces, of the puzzle to make a spaceship go. But yeah. man, the things that really, really ruin your day are things like gas leaking out, uh, the <laughs> toilet not working. Right? Like right. I've I spent two hours this morning looking at toilet designs for for new toilets to go to the moon. <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking at really inter- I wish I could talk about them because they're NDA, but just some really interesting approaches using the laws of physics to move uh, number one and new, number two in the correct direction. Um, yeah. All of the little things are the things that wreck your day. And it's that systems integration that always like just the simple, like I need a processor to do this, right? You could probably write the code on your microcontroller in an afternoon to do what you need to do, but to have it integrate with other people is going to take you the rest of the year. And then the complexities of, uh, I, I want to get on that in a second. That's actually, this is perfect. You're like outlining this thing for me perfectly. I'm an engineer. <laughs> You're an engineer. <laughs> See? We know how to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> they say that engineers can't communicate, but I communicate with other engineers just fine. That's right. Because we communicate efficiently. <laughs> Data, and then you say something I acknowledge, and then I transmit back. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, I don't have to guess. You just said what you wanted to say. Um, so... <laughs> But uh, when when you start looking at the complexities, um, we'll get to the toilet in a second. But when you start looking at <laughs> the, the, com- <laughs> the complexities of some, <laughs> all right, um, uh, the one of the things that I think is the coolest marriage of technology to um, that truly is life saving and game changing is uh, the F thirty five helmet. This four hundred thousand dollar helmet that enables you to make even better decisions now um, just because of the amount of information that's displayed in there. Can you describe that at all? So I, the caveat, I have not flown the F-35. Uh, I have worked with it and did testing with it for landing on the boat, but I'm familiar with the systems. So I, I'll caveat right up front, I haven't flown the helmet. Uh, okay, we cool. have a, uh, I don't know, a generation behind that in the in the Super Hornet, but the, the, what we call essay enhancing or the situational awareness enhancement. And we're talking about, like, I was just in a conversation last night talking about the same technique and technology for landing on the moon. And it's, it's putting what you need to know on the glass in front of you and overlaying it with the world. So this is a specific category called augmented reality. Mm-hmm. And so the F-35 can take its sensors in the different spectrums that it senses in and overlay that information in front of you. And so in the Super Hornet, it was incredible because I could type in various essay enhancing things into my computer, right? It went a very inconvenient spot behind the control stick. I could type in, hey, this is the lat long of where the good guys are. And there's some other good guys at this lat long and other good guys at this lat long, but there's bad guys at this lat long. All of the information is in my computer. And then the Super Hornet and the F-35 have networks. And so they're transferring data between aircraft and between surface assets and all of these, everything is in a giant uh, encrypted network sending data back and forth. And so all of that information was on your screen inside the cockpit. And then you would have to, as a human, translate what I'm seeing on the cockpit to things I'm looking out the window and seeing, trying to figure out on the ground where the good guys are, the bad guys are, right? And what was really cool was now that the information is in my display and it's my helmet spatially aware. So when I wrote, I look out the window and I look over the ground, overlaid in my display, in my helmet is like, you know, this image in characters and it puts a box on the ground around the good guys and a box around the bad guys. Wow. Right. Yeah. 
And if I'm not looking at them, I could say, hey, I want to find this thing. And if I'm looking to the right, there's an arrow in my helmet pointing to the left, saying it's to the left. And as I move my head, you know, the arrow has like degrees in it. It says like 42 degrees to the left. So I start moving my head. I mean, my head, my neck is not calibrated for 42 degrees. It just isn't. Um, <laughs> Come on, man. On it. I know. <laughs> you would think after decades of school, I could have a neck calibrated to the degree, but it's not. <laughs> um, so as you turn your head, the number gets smaller if you're going in the correct direction. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, that 42 decrements in 30, 20, 20, you know, 15 until it's inside the field of view of the helmet. And then it puts a box around the thing you were looking for. And so it used to take, you know, a couple minutes to like look at the chart. And then look outside and goes, okay, that's a river. Okay, that's a road. And they touch there. And then the good guys are at the intersection of the river. Oh, there's two rivers. Oh, man. And there's three roads. Which, which one is it, right? And that kind of confusion, right? And you're, you don't want to, you know, what we would say, go kinetic uh, on a situation that you don't have full SA on. Because uh, there's some serious decision being made. So we're, we're looking at this for the moon, right? So, you know, yesterday I'm in discussions about the design for the lander on the moon. And we're talking about pieces of glass that we're going to put up. And we're talking about, you know, do we put some sort of heads up display, some sort of visual overlay, right? And we're going to uh, a spot on the moon uh, that uh, the lighting isn't necessarily as, you know, direct, right? It's at the south pole of the moon. So there's going to be lots of shadows. How do we enhance the situation awareness of, of the astronaut coming to land on the south pole of the moon when there's big craters and, you know, maybe the light is always on the horizon. So there's giant shadows. Are we going to use different parts of the spectrum? Are we going to use laser beams? Are we going to use infrared? Are we going to, what are we going to use? And can, can maybe we overlay that in the heads up uh, glass or not necessarily, maybe on a helmet, maybe not in a helmet to show, hey, this, this is there, right? And so all of the electrical engineering behind the scenes that happens to fuse all of that data that's coming in from sensors outside your spacecraft or outside your fighter jet so that you can have the SA to, to land, right? You only have so much fuel landing on the moon. Uh, you only have a, you know, maybe 30 seconds of fuel. Who knows yet what the design's going to be? But, you know, there's, you know, Neil, Neil landing on the moon only had a few seconds of fuel remaining when he touched down on the surface of the moon. Um, all the engineering that goes into that. Microchip's portfolio of integrated technology supports the most demanding requirements for space, aviation, and defense microelectronics. Recent introductions include Microchip's ARM-based microcontrollers, a space industry first which combine the low-cost and large ecosystem benefits of commercial, off-the-shell technology with space-qualified, scalable levels of radiation performance. Go to microchip.com slash aerospace to learn more. As an engineer yourself, um, do you feel that the engineering industry in general places adequate emphasis on safety for the people using this, or is it sometimes easy for engineers to forget about the person, um, you know, Matt, for instance, in the cockpit, um, who who is using this technology? Well, what you've hit what you've hit upon is is a very large portion of what I do at work, um, it, 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 and it's what I did in flight test for testing uh, aircraft, and it's it's what we do here in NASA as astronauts. As we work with engineers, like I'm involved in the landers, I'm involved in, in one of the new space capsules that goes to the space station. And um, there are lots of descriptions of what I do for my job, but I think one of the best descriptors is translator. And so my job is at, with an engineering background, a technical background, and having worked on you know acquisition products with the government is to translate you know, what engineers are doing to the end user and what the end user is doing back to the engineer, right? And so when you are sitting in the meeting, with the engineers designing it, your job is to kind of, hey, remember there's a, there's a pink body inside this thing, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or this toilet you've designed, while is really, really good at getting rid of fecal matter, it's going to be a giant mess and really hard to use, and this looks really uncomfortable. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, can you, like, they come up with these scenarios like, well, just, just wear your spacesuit for 144 hours. <laughs> okay, uh, let's talk through why this might not go well. <laughs> and so, it, it, and they say, well, you know, and it's funny because you have like these design requirements that, you know, humans can do this and humans are capable of that, right? Uh, and I said, well, like, you know, you could go 30, you know, you can go 30 days without food. Uh, okay, yes, I know, but uh, <laughs> that might affect the decision making that you will depend upon <laughs> later down the line for pushing right. buttons, right? Uh, and, and one of the things we always talk about is, 
you know, engineers love their systems. Me too. Like I build stuff at home and I, I, you know, for fun. And you always think the thing you design is like amazing. And other people mm-hmm. are like, whoa, whoa. Dude. Right. Like there's some very <laughs> clear failure modes you haven't considered here. So there's being that human and seeing that, right. And, and the, the engineers at NASA are incredible. The, 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 the spaceship designers that, you know, we put contracts to are amazing. They don't lose sight of that human aspect. Right. But, you know, we still sit in the room, we talk to them and some of them, and they're so passionate about keeping the astronauts safe. Right. And, and also passionate about understanding that, Hey, sometimes my system might not work. Like one of the big things we always train to and talk to in failure modes, it's a real problem is, is loss of signal. Right? So the, so many problems that we come up with, like, Oh, well the ground will just upload some new software or upload a new command to the space vehicle and all problems will be solved. Well, if, if you lose communication with the space vehicle, right? Like there are very narrow angles you have to point at your communication satellites. If the vehicle is slightly askew or off its axis, then it's not pointing at the satellite. You'd lost calm. Now the crew needs to be on board and able to handle itself. Right. Uh, they need to be able to command the vehicle themselves. So circle back way back to your question. That's my job. My job is to remind engineers that maybe got really deep into the engineering side. There's still a human body inside. Uh, but I, I'm not, I'm not discounting them. They, they are very much aware of what's at stake because they are so passionate about expanding human horizons, expanding exploration, going to the moon, going to stay, getting on the, the lunar surface and building the base there uh, is so important. These fake people, they're so impassioned by it. Yeah. To have your perspective and to have all of your experience, uh, your background in engineering, I, I imagine that makes you extremely valuable if you look at the development of aerospace technology as a production cycle, of course, you're going to have prototyping, you're going to have testing, you're going to have finally, you know, final production. The feedback loop in that is you. Like, you're the person saying, you know, I understand you guys thought it would be a good idea to have all these accelerometers, right? But it turns out it, it is overloading me with information. Like, which, which thing do I need to be paying attention to? Right. Exactly. So, that, I mean, that... The human system integration component is a big part of, of what I do. And, and that's why, you know, I, I, I can get excited at little things like toasters. I can get excited about cockpits and how they work. And I've, I've sat in a lot of different cockpits in that, you know, that's why I kind of started to deep dive on you on the touch screen and we didn't even touch the surface of the touch screen concept. Really bad, bad joke there. Uh, <laughs> but uh, like, there's so much you got, we could just sit down and talk about the human system and how it integrates with, with, human made systems. And that interface is so fascinating. And that, that's really what I do. Right. I grew up on a farm and I remember clearly my dad fixing a piece of equipment that was clearly uh, made uh, for ease of manufacturability. Right. But the second somebody had to actually put their wrench on it and try to fix it, I remember my dad it, and made, I was probably eight years old and it made all the sense in the world to me. He's like, you know, Whoever designed this thing clearly never had to work on it. And that's the most important part of anything that humans are using, whether it is a a favorite toaster or getting yourself so you can land on the moon with exactly as much fuel as you've you've designed for. Your feedback is what's essentially bringing up the technology so it can grow up. And then the the technology is helping us grow up and evolve um, sort of as, as people and what we're able to accomplish. I'm curious, what observations can you share uh, with us about, um, we'll say maybe the recent influx, once again, the interest in space travel, um, you know, especially with, with now um, in the, uh, the non-government sector, you know, having successful space travel. Uh, what, uh, what are some of the more exciting advancements in the field, in the technology uh, that you think engineers should know about? Oh, man. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that, but I'm going to go back because I think it's related to what you were talking about with your dad. Mm -hmm. The guy that designed this didn't have to work on it. Man, I've been to a few, uh, I'll call them rocket factories. And you know, that you, you see, you see Silicon Valley's, you know, disruptive concept, you know, entering the field of rockets and spaceships, which is super cool. Uh, and you see them bringing kind of their software mentality, right? Um, the spiral development, the version control, like what you would do on like a, like a GitHub, right? And you see that kind of being applied to rockets and it's really cool. Uh, and then the concept to talk about what you said about, you know, the engineer doesn't, didn't have to build it or work on it. Well, now you're seeing these rocket factories being built 
where they know that exact problem. And so what they've done is they put the folks with the CAD and the designing part right next to the factory floor. Aha. And they empower the person on the factory floor who's building it to walk over to the engineer that designed it and maybe like hit him in the head with a wrench, jokingly, <laughs> and like, hey, come look at this rocket. And so the designers are getting out of their CAD models and they're going on the factory floor and they're turning wrenches and going, wow, if I reorient this this way, it will, you know, I'm not adding any mass and I can build it faster. Hmm. And so that's two way, right? Or, you know, and, and that the, the guy on the floor building it can go talk to the, the person designing it and vice versa, right? They can both have this open two way communication. Whereas before maybe those two elements were separated. And so having that communication and having that open workspace, uh, I think is, is we're going to be able to design, build, test, design, build, test in that iterative loop so much faster. Right? Like it's, that was like for me when I, you know, like we all have weird hobbies. I kind of like to write software every now and then. Um, <laughs> nice. And because you just, it's really, you just get this instant satisfaction, right? Yes. Uh, you build, you get this such really, it's so weird. And maybe I can get out with you on the, on the, over this about this, but you, you write a piece of code. It doesn't work. You write a piece of code. It doesn't work. Then it works, right? The, the number comes out yeah. and then you start modifying and it doesn't work and you start editing it and then it comes out and then you get like, this. just, I don't know. I think there's like a dopamine response to my brain when the, the thing that I wanted to come out on the screen, like I'm typing in the code window and then it comes out on the display. I'm like, yes. And yes. That, that OODA loop is so fast, but you could imagine how hard that would be if you're building something like a car or, or something complicated that's mechanical and big, right? And so that's slow. You don't get that dopamine response as fast. Uh, but now we've got 3D printing, right? So 3D printing is cool because I can design on my computer and it's printing my garage and then I can go get the part. Like that speed is what we're starting to see in rocket design. Uh, and we're starting to see in spaceships. Right. So uh, somebody somebody has almost like an aha moment, an epiphany moment, and they say, oh, my gosh, what if we tried this? And now we can we can design for that, test for that very rapidly. And it is, by the way, it is a dopamine hit. That's I'm a I'm a software guy through and through because I can go back and examine the code, do the logic in my head and then, OK, that's that's what I was saying wrong. And we're we're actually going to structure the loop this way. Um, as opposed to the analog design world where I felt like I did all the math, the math was perfect. Why are you still not working? And, and once the math doesn't work, then I just feel like, oh my gosh, what? that leads to a very interesting problem. That's one of our, I think a key core problem. It's like a repetitive story. The analog stuff takes a long time. You don't get the dopamine response. Mm -hmm. So as a result, and I'm just putting this logic tree together right now, real time. As a result, when you are given a problem, your go-to design choice is the digital one with software because yeah. you get those responses back. When I think a lot of times we should be building more analog stuff. I'm not saying digital is wrong. I'm saying analog should be considered more because it has lower latency typically. Yes. So yes. It has lower latency, but instead we're saying, Oh, I can fix that in software. I can fix that in software. And you get this software blow. The complexity blows up, the latency goes up and it doesn't work for the end user. Yep. Texas Instruments QMLV qualified Radiation Hardness Assured and Space EP products are optimized for high performance and power density. TI helps you meet the most demanding accuracy, thermal, and radiation design requirements to operate in the harshest conditions. Discover more about mission-critical high-rel products for harsh environments at www.ti.com space. you expect like the next uh, couple of decades you're, you're a young guy um and you've already done so much um do you see the next couple decades of your career bringing some pretty major tech advancements like electronics engineering advancements that you're already seeing on the horizon uh, that maybe the rest of us don't see because we're not in that particular job you know things that would really significantly change the na uh, the nature of air combat or you know space travel that sort of thing uh, let's think about this. Give me a second. I would say, I mean, there's just, it's, there might be some big, you know, crazy discovery, but I think it's unlikely. I think it's the little things that add up to the big things that will really make the big difference. 
you know, we have energy is always, you know, people like, oh, we don't have enough energy. And I say, ah, it's energy, you know, it's, it's the classic problem of the electric airplane, right? Like it's an energy storage problem, an energy density problem, right? Like the, yeah. the sun is rating, rating down on us at like something like 2000 watts per square meter. And I remember thinking about that when I was in college and we, there's energy is there. Like there's a lot. We just don't, we need a place to store it. And that's always a battle with, you know, rocket design is this trade off of, okay, I, do I carry batteries? Do I carry solar arrays? You know, how many batteries do I carry? We just, we just finished putting all new batteries on the space station, you know, upgrading the space station from uh, nickel metal hydride to lithium polymer batteries. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, you know, the energy storage situation, we're having this great debate about, you're always having this great debate about what, how do we, you know, what rocket propellant, which is essentially energy storage, right? Because we're yep. converting some sort of energy storage to kinetic energy to get the rocket where I need to go. Do I, do I use, you know, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, that's great. It's got a great, you know, uh, specific impulse, uh, but you know, it takes up a lot of space because hydrogen, well, it's hydrogen. If you know the elements, uh, it takes up a lot of space, even liquid form. Uh, you know, you, we see new folks working with methalox, which is meth me uh, methane and oxygen. Uh, so there's just this, all of these trade spaces of managing energy, you know, and so if you can solve the energy density problem, right. Or safety issue, you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells are being considered for aircraft. Um, batteries don't really work for aircraft because they just don't have the energy density because uh, they're just so heavy and you're just not getting the same energy. And oh, by the way, the airplane's not getting lighter as you fly, which, right. with it, which it does with petroleum products, which have an insane oh, yeah. energy. Density. And so airplanes, you know, you have lift, you have drag, uh, you have weight, and you have thrust. The four is that they're all in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but the uh, as the airplane's flying, you're losing weight. The, the jet fuel is being burned and you're getting lighter. And as a result, you need less lift to maintain your same altitude and less lift because there's drag due to lift. There's less drag. So you get more efficient. And so there's that problem. Like we aren't just going to be dropping little battery pods as they burn off across the country on parachutes. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's just an, an interesting problem to solve. Uh, so there's that. Uh, but when you're going to the moon, so all of these, like the energy thing. So where are we going? Uh, I think it's solving all the little problems. So even little things like Apollo, they land on the moon, they put on their spaceships, they open the door, they go out, they walk around, they come back in and they do it a couple of times. But little things like just the gasket for the door, that only had to work like twice, three times. Right. But there, there's, no, there's no wind. There's no wind on the moon. It's all related. Right. There's no wind on the moon. And what does that mean? There's no water in the moon. Or it's, I mean, there is, there's water in the moon, but it's frozen. It's not flowing. So you're not, you're not breaking down the, the, the sand or the regolith on the moon. And so it's really, really, really sharp and it's abrasive and it just cuts through stuff. Hmm. Uh, sand, sand on the earth has been smoothed by wind and water. Like yeah. you don't find sharp rocks. Like if you go touch volcanic, right, it's super sharp. So it's going to destroy your gasket. So the things that are, like the technological breakthroughs we need to deal with are that. Like how often have you been able to keep your smartphone for more, greater than a year and a half without breaking it? If we're going to go to the Mars, we need our, we need our, we need our spaceship to last for a year and a half, right? It's nine months there. It's nine months back to Mars. So the moon is our proving ground. So we got to go figure out how to make stuff last a couple of weeks and then a couple of months and then a full year when you're not that far from earth, right? So it was, we think about technological breakthroughs, we need to just go do all the little things, the spiral development, the, the version control system for each little upgrade and learning thing we come up with rockets so we can figure out how to operate on the moon when we're three days away from Earth. So Mars, at its furthest point from Earth, is 240 million miles away. Wow, yeah. So we start at 240 miles to the ISS, multiply by 1,000 to get to the moon, multiply by 1,000 again. And so Mars is a million times further away than the ISS. And people can't even fathom how far the ISS is away. Right, right. Well, so, and meanwhile four months ago in the in the kind of the height of the first covid wave here in the united states we, we, we've got engineers sitting at home on their whatever broadband connection piloting rovers uh, it just blows me away. i was just thinking like the, the stuff that you're working on is so cool now let's compare that engineering goes it's like water i mean it can go everywhere and it just depends on where you point it and so um you compare, let's compare your first 10 years, right? Uh, with my first 10 years of my career as an engineer, I too completed my undergrad uh, in engineering from a major university. Five years later, I'm talking to some 
vice president of something or other uh, at and they make uh, small appliances. And he's asking me to help him invent a toaster that'll connect to the internet and download recipes to itself. Uh, and I'm sitting in a conference room uh, with this guy, and I'm like, recipes for uh, for toasted bread? Is that what we're talking about? And he goes, well, yeah, different types of bread, white, wheat, you know, uh, we want to corner bagels. <laughs> and I remember thinking, my God, the biggest thing I'm designing this year is a toaster that solves problems nobody has. I wanted to kill myself. So what you've been able to do is parlay an engineering background and this highly technical background and an understanding of why open architecture would matter in in aerospace and why you know artificial intelligence is going to be something that's something we have to solve for you've been able to parlay that into a really killer career but there's also that part of you as an engineer um that has a favorite toaster tell me about it oh okay. i'm so glad you came back to the toaster we've teased it through this entire episode <laughs> and for those listeners who've still managed to listen to my voice this entire time <laughs> That nice astronaut. I was trying so hard not to laugh when you said internet-enabled toaster. Because uh, I know you, you, had, you had some like incredible words of wisdom coming out, and I was just dying inside. Because I saw like I saw that, and I saw something recently. It was like an internet-enabled iron, uh, an ironing for your clothes. And I'm going, people, people, are people buying these things? Just turn the damn thing on and put it on your shirt. Okay, so let's go through the toaster. <laughs> Uh, right. I'm distracted and teased enough. <laughs> so a toaster. The the goal is to take a piece of bread and <laughs> to heat it up at sufficient enough temperature such that you impart the Maillard reaction on the surface and it crisps it up and it and just explodes with thousands of flavor chemicals. Uh, and it's got that crispy <laughs> exterior and that soft interior that just is so, for some reason, satisfying to human taste buds. That's exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. That is what we're going to do with this toaster. The classic toaster plugs into uh, an AC port and you push the thing down and it's a mechanical device, pure analog, and it engages a spring and there's a timer set with a knob between one and some number. It's non-dimensional. It's either one or it's 10 or somewhere in between. And it's got these resistive coils on the outside. Am I describing a toaster? I am. And the... Nailing it. <laughs> I, and it heats up the outside of the bread and you look, it doesn't, you don't want it too dark, or you don't want it too light, because then it might not have enough Maillard reaction for the surface, or they might have too much and have burnt flavor. <laughs> and so you're trying to nail the set points, and this is like a common human struggle, and you push the lever down, and it goes into its process. And maybe your toaster only has one slot or two slots, and you want four pieces of bread. And so after some preset unknown period of time, it pops back up, and you pull it out, and you eat it. And maybe your friend wants a piece of toast. Yeah. So you, you put a piece of toast, and you're like, man, that was perfect. We nailed it this time. And you push it back down, but you neglect the fact that the toaster is now heated up. And so it's starting from a hotter state. So this next piece of toast, even though it's on the same setting, is burned. Yep. And so like you learn over time, okay, I know that if I'm starting from a cold toaster, I got to start on four. And then in my second piece of toast, I go to a three and a half. And then in my third piece of toast, I go to a three. <laughs> right? These are, this is, this is the human struggle with the toaster. And I'm like, the only way to solve this is if it's got to be internet of things. There's no other way to solve this. <laughs> no, people, no. Just sit down with your user engineer. Just sit down with your user and observe them in their, or, you know, their, their indigenous environment and watch them struggle with your toaster. Yes. I, wa I ran into this toaster a couple years ago. That I, like, my wife thought I was nuts. I was at a friend's house. We were actually at a friend's parent's house. And I just started losing my mind at this toaster. And they're like, it's a toaster. But it had this really cool feature. So you would, and it, it there was one overkill thing, but it just was so satisfying. You would push the button and it would, like, dramatically lower the toast in. It wasn't like you pushed it down. Oh, nice. It had this yeah. motor. And it was just, it was like, I felt like Star Wars. And it was like this, the death march as the toaster went in. And he just, it was so... Total overkill, but I would have paid at least 30 bucks for that feature. I could go for some toast. <laughs> toast. Bum, 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 bum. And then this toaster. The toast goes in. And so, and then the, the toast came out. It wasn't toasted enough. And I was looking at this myriad of buttons on the front of the toaster, and it was the best labeled button I have ever seen. It just said, it was a lot of text. It said, just a little bit more. 
Oh. And, you, <laughs> and you, you pushed this button because the toast had obviously come back out in this dramatic <laughs> session. And you're like, that's just, that's just not enough. Yeah. And so you just push this button and it would dramatically go back in and it would toast it just a little bit more. And then it would dramatically go out. And it was perfect. I was like, they understand my problem. They have solved it. This is it. I was so is that excited. A death star? You underestimate the flavor of the dark side. Uh, that's dude that's exactly a that's that's why we have engineers is somebody and you know what the next evolution of that is the the machine learning model which is my my interpretation of just a little bit more was not quite right so next time i'll give him even more of a little bit more um but this i know you can't say who the brands are so afterwards i want to get from you the the serial number of this and i'm (laughs) gonna buy one i mean i i was like this is you know, and, and I don't talk brands, but like this is just a a really cool connection with the user. You understand the user, right? Uh, maybe throw in a little bit of a Gucci feature there with the very dramatic entrance and exit of the toast. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I think maybe after the hundredth time, I would be a little impatient and just like snatch the toast out. Uh, <laughs> and, and and you could over. I mean, you could go overkill on this thing. Like you could have like some sort of infrared sensor in there that's looking at the surface of the toast that knows that the myriad reaction happens at this temperature or like you know the things that slow the myriad reaction down like if it's particular if it's a a piece of toast that has a lot of moisture in it right so you you know if there's a lot of moisture it's got to boil off that moisture before the browning of the toast occurs i know way too much about toast right now this is uncomfortable no this is great (laughs) but it's it that is a classic thing and i think if you take that design principle and apply it to everything you do and understand the user and do the trade-offs you will build great things Yes. Matt, this you just landed this conversation as perfectly as the lunar lander I one day anticipate. Do you see yourself uh do you see yourself uh actually going into orbit at some point in your career? Uh I hope so. I think it's kind of in the job title. Uh so I'm hoping to go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe you're actually an astronaut unless you go to space. NASA is very kind that they refer to us as astronauts before we fly, but I, I really don't think I'm an astronaut until I go to space. Otherwise, you're, you're just talking about it. How does that work? Are you brought up like in a farm system or is it just luck of the draw? <laughs> a farm system. Uh, yeah. I do have to run. I do have to. I literally have to go to training this afternoon. Oh, shoot. Uh, yeah. OK, cool. But hey, we could talk all day uh, about this <laughs> and I will uh, shoot you a message about the brand name. Please do. Hey, man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And, and, and keep up the great work. I'm really in awe of, of everything you're doing. Awesome. So I think I have the coolest job, hands down. (laughs) Um, What an amazing conversation with the finely quaffed astronaut Matthew Dominic. Thanks to Matthew, and thanks from all of us to the wonderful folks at NASA for permitting and coordinating this interview. Let us know what you thought of the conversation by dropping your comments onto this episode's page on allaboutcircuits.com. And if you enjoy this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review and some good thoughts on Apple, Google, or wherever you listen. It's a small gesture that really does go a long way in helping us to build a meaningful community of listeners and contributors. Thanks for listening.